Our reading today is from Matthew 25, 14, and 15. I'll be reading from the NIV version. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who has called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. Well, that really moved us. A little boy so determined to stay in the race, even when it looked like he couldn't make it any further. It was race day at Colonial Hills Elementary School near Columbus, Ohio. Go! They were off, and right there at the back of the pack, 11-year-old Matt Woodruff determined to run with the rest of the class. Go, Maddie! But it wasn't long before Matt was trailing a bit. He had cerebral palsy and was told he didn't have to run that race, and he could sit it out. But Matt wanted it. Making his way around that track, his proud mom videotaping the whole thing. Suddenly, Matt starts to slow down, starts to struggle. And watch the left corner of your screen. Right there, that's gym teacher John Blaine walking toward Matt on the field. Soon, some gentle coaching is by his side. Come on, buddy! That gym teacher would stay right there the rest of the race. And then something else. Suddenly, his classmates begin to notice. And one by one, they start making their way toward Matt, too. The crowd is swelling beside him. And so does their chant. Matt rounding that final bend, his entire class in tow, every step of the way, and then his rally, teachers watching at the end, the cheers at the finish line. He did it. <laughs> Afterward, his mother could hardly find him in the midst of all of his fans. A high five there, and a hug. That race now going viral on the internet, and Matt told me just today on the phone what that moment was like, that entire class behind him. It was tiring, but it really helped when my classmates and my coach and everybody swarmed me. It was really encouraging. Mom, who was there taping it all, and Dad, who saw it later, both so proud of me. I couldn't have been more proud of my son. It was very heartwarming. Dad's proud, and so are we. And in fact, Matt told me if he had to race all again tomorrow, he would do it for sure. 808,000 hits now on that video on the internet. The race at one elementary school that really moved us. A little boy so determined. We're in the uh, middle of our fourth pregnancy now. I've, I, I live with three beautiful girls. I've heard the phrase and I, I know well what it means. Sometimes you just need a good cry. Uh, <laughs> If you came here needing a good cry this morning, you're welcome. Uh, there you have it. Uh, we're going to be talking about giving our best this morning. And certainly that video is just a beautiful picture of what it looks like to give one's best. And we will talk a little bit more about that video in just a few moments. Uh, first, though, I want to begin with the story this morning. The old story goes there. Times were hard. Economic times were, were very difficult. And Joe had lost his job, he couldn't find another job. And he was willing to do about anything, but he couldn't find anything. And so he was walking down that lonely road one day and he happened to pass by a zoo. And he looked and he said, well, I can see if they're hiring. He walked in, asked the manager, do y'all have any positions available? And the manager said, no, I'm, I'm sorry, friend. We, we have nothing. Times are rough here as well. We can't hire you. And so Joe starts to walk out of that office, but the manager calls out and he said, hey, buddy, hey, this is crazy, I know, but you wouldn't be willing to wear a gorilla suit, would you? Uh, you see, times are tough on us as well, and well, our gorilla died last week, and it's really, you wouldn't believe how much gorillas cost. We can't replace it yet, so I know this sounds crazy, but if you would like to wear a gorilla suit and, and go in the cage and be a gorilla all day long, we, we could pay you to do that. And so Joe said, well, I can't find anything else. I'll be a gorilla, and so he does. And so he gets there every single morning before the crowds arrive, and he puts on that gorilla suit, and he goes out. And he actually finds out he kind of likes it. He runs around all day. It's very freeing. Uh, he's a rather gifted, strong man. He swings from the trees all day long. He loves the crowds coming and saying, oh, look at the gorilla. He likes it. And so he goes in this manner for his first day, second day. Third day, there's a problem. Because as he's swinging from those trees, he slips, and he falls into the lion's cage. 
And for about half of a second, there's this thought, there, there's this decision to make because I need to cry out for help. I need to get somebody to get me out of here. But if I do, my cover's blown and there goes my job. And so that decision fleets across his mind, but he decides, you know what, this is really no decision at all. And he starts to cry out for help. Help me, help me, somebody come get me out of here. At which point the lion looks at him and snaps back, shut up or we'll both lose our jobs. <laughs> Identity problems, identity problems. Who are we? Who are we? As we talk about giving our best to God, as we talk about giving our best to His work and to our service of Him, I think identity problems is one of the biggest obstacles that we face. Who are we? What are we about? I would say that nine times out of ten, and this has been verified, but nine times out of ten, you can do just about anything that you set your mind to do. Nine times out of ten, you can come up with an excuse of why you cannot do just about anything that you really don't want to do. And when it comes to giving our best to God, how I view His kingdom, how I view my role in His kingdom, that's what it really comes down to. Am I seeing this clearly? Who am I? What am I about? Here's what I mean. I came up with a little list of things that, ways that we might look at what we do here in the church. The difference between a job and a ministry. You might have come here this morning having a job in the church. You might have come here this morning having a ministry. Uh, whatever your, your given task or offering is, if you're doing it because no one else will, it's a job. If you're doing it to serve the Lord, it's a ministry. If you're doing it so long as it doesn't interfere with other activities, it's a job. Uh, but if you're willing to do it, even if that means putting other things aside that you really like to do, well, that's a ministry. If you quit because no one praised you or because no one thanked you, it's a job. If you're committed to staying with it even though nobody seems to notice, it's a ministry. If your concern is success, then it's a job. If your concern is faithfulness, it's a ministry. It is really hard to get excited about a job. But it's really hard to get excited about doing anything else in the world when you have a ministry. And so as we talk about giving our best effort, I think it really starts here. How do I look at my service to God? How do I view what I am in the kingdom, what my role is in the kingdom? Because service looked at as a job just feels burdensome. It really quickly gets that way. But when we see it as an opportunity to partner with the God of the universe and carry on His work, well, that's something amazing. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we could walk in them. That's what we were created to do. Before this whole world was created, think about how astounding that is. Before He laid the foundations of this earth, He was thinking of you and your ministry. Now I'm going to create my children for good works. That's what we were created to do. And so this morning, if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 25, our text has been called the parable of the talents. We're going to look at the parable of the talents and we're going to run through three different things that will guide us in our path towards giving our best in the service of our Lord. Matthew chapter 25 verses 14 through 30. It's probably a very familiar passage to you. The kingdom of, the heaven, the kingdom of heaven is like a man and he goes out on a journey. And he's going to be a long journey and so he entrusts his possessions to three of his servants, his stewards. To one he gives five talents, to the other he gives three, to the other or two, uh, to the other he gives one. And then he leaves. And he leaves them to do what they will with those talents. The one who received five, he works very hard. It says he traded with those five talents and he earns five more. The one who received two, likewise, worked very hard, traded with those two talents, he receives two more. The one who received one is afraid. Because how terrible would it be if he traded with that one talent and he lost it and his master came back and he had nothing. And so he goes and he digs a hole and he puts that talent in the ground and he covers it up and time passes. A very long time, the scripture says. And the master comes back and he begins to settle accounts with these servants. And he calls the one before him who had given five. And he says, look, I worked hard. I traded with these five talents. I got five more. And the master says, good job. Very good job. You've been faithful with just a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. The man who had received two talents came before him. Look, I worked very hard. I traded with those two talents. I got two more. The master says, good job. Very well done. 
You've been faithful with a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. The man who received one comes before him, very afraid. Master, I, I know the, the way things work around here. You're very hard, and you reap where you do not sow. And, and I didn't want to come before you empty-handed, and I was afraid. And I hid my one talent. See, here it is. I've dusted it back off. You have what you gave to me. And the master is not pleased at all. You could have at least put this in the bank. It would have gotten interest for me. And yet, you've been wicked. You've been lazy. Take that one talent from that man and give it to the man who had five talents. Throw him into the outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Unprofitable servant he was. And so we have this parable here in Matthew chapter 25. And as it sits, it's the third parable in a string of three parables. Uh, Jesus has come into Jerusalem. He knows it will be his last trip into Jerusalem that he will die on this occasion. And so he begins to tell parables. He's already talked about the fall of the temple. Not one stone will be left upon another. That's Matthew chapter 24, the earlier part. And there towards the end of Matthew chapter 24, he starts telling these kingdom parables. Uh, the kingdom of heaven, was, it's like this one servant who his master left and, and he thought he was in the clear. And so he started to beat the other ones and he started to eat and drink with the drunkards. Uh, parable number one, Jesus wants us to know that in, in light of the coming of Jesus, that he will come back one day. In light of that, we should abstain from sin. We shouldn't think that just because he's gone that we can do whatever we want to do. He says you need to be aware of that. Parable number two, the parable of the ten virgins. Uh, some of them are wise and bring ample oil in excess of what they've already got in their lamps. Some of them are not wise and they don't bring any extra. And so the bridegroom comes and the door is shut and they're left outside. Jesus would have us know, yes, I'm going to be gone a long time, but you need to make preparation for the coming of the kingdom. Ample preparation. Don't just prepare a little bit. Don't just try to scoot by. You need to make ample preparation for my coming. And now we come to this third parable. And Jesus wants us to know that it's not enough just to abstain from sin. It's not enough just to make ample preparation for my second coming. I want to find you working with what I've given you when I come again. And that's where we find ourselves, Matthew chapter 25. I want to point out three things about this parable that I think will guide us in giving our absolute best in our service to God. The first thing that I want us to notice here in this parable is who do the talents belong to? Who do these talents even belong to? Look at verse 14, the very beginning of this parable. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. He entrusted his possessions to them. They did not become their possessions. They were his possessions and he entrusted them to them. If you look at towards the end at verse 27, then you ought to have put my money in the bank and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. The money never ceased to be the landowners. It's my money. It's my possessions. And if you think about it, there was once a time when there was nothing, nothing in existence. Uh, we think of space now as, as being nothing. There's something. There was nothing except for God and His three holy persons. That was it. And then from that stems everything that you see before you now, the universe, this room, everything it stands to reason then that everything belongs to those three persons that were with us in the beginning. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everything belongs to Him. Everything. And not just stuff. Yes, stuff belongs to Him. My money belongs to Him. I belong to Him. My mind belongs to Him. My talents belong to Him. My abilities belong to Him. My influence, the places that I go, it all belongs to Him. Everything belongs to the Master. And so as this parable begins, what we really have is the story of humanity following the departure of Christ. I've empowered and equipped my servants, and now I'm leaving. And one day I will come again. But that's where we live right now. You look at verse 19. It says, Now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. You know, there, there are some who are confused. And there are some who have been confused for a very long time. That, that Jesus left and they thought, well, he'd be right back. Peter talks about scoffers who will say, your master said he was coming back. Where is he? I don't see him. The, the, the parable here, Jesus tells us, it's going to be a long time. I'll be gone for a long time, and after a long time, the master returns. 
God's established His work on this earth. He's giving us talents, abilities, resources, everything that we need to work with, and He's left for a long time, and He will return one day. And so we are those who are left here to manage those things which are God's. It belongs to God's. We are those who are here to manage those things which belong to God's. 1 Peter chapter 4, what are we supposed to do with these things? 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 10, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We are stewards in charge of God's things, and He expects us to use them to His glory. Uh, stewardship, we talk about stewardship often. It doesn't just relate to that 10% or, or whatever that amount is that I put into the plate. That's not just the, the whole of the topic of stewardship. Stewardship means that everything belongs to God. Not just the couple of hours that I'm here worshiping Him. Every waking hour, every sleeping hour, it all belongs to Him. All of me, all of my resources, all of my abilities, it all belongs to Him. It's very important as we begin to talk about giving our best to God that we realize it, everything I have is God's. Point number two, though. As we, as we try to realize that it is all God's, it's kind of difficult. When I look around... And I see that some people have more of God's stuff than other people. A lot of people have more of God's stuff than I have. And I'm not just talking about money. I'm not just talking about uh, physical resources. Some people are way more talented than others. So some people are smarter than others. Some people uh, just seem to have more faith than others. So some people are just more equipped for the things that I feel like God wants us to do than others. And I look around and I think, well, it all belongs to God, but there's, some, there's a discrepancy. There, there's some people that have more of God's stuff than others, and what am I supposed to do with that? The second thing we need to be aware of is that God works not in portions, but in proportions. Look at again at verse 15. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. And he went on his journey. You know, the video that we watched this morning it is direct to this point, isn't it? Who was the winner in that race? Uh, those kids that were participating in that race, I don't know if but one of them could tell you today who won that race. Who was the fastest kid? Uh, there was the fastest kid. There's the biggest kid. Uh, the, the kid who showed up in the nicest car. Uh, all these things don't matter. When you look at the things that truly matter, the winner on that day was that kid who came in last. The slowest kid. God wants us to do our best. Because God works in proportions and not in portions. And I look around and I see the money that I don't have. And I see the talents that I don't have. And I see the abilities that I don't have. And sometimes I don't know why. Why don't I have? Well, God knows why. I might know, not know why, but God knows why. Because He tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18, But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body, just as He desired. Just as it makes Him happy. He gave me what He gave me because He desired it. He put me where He put me because He desired it. Not because I desired it. Not because I even understood it. But because He desired it and He wanted it that way. You may remember in Acts chapter 3, we have the story of a, a man who was lame from his mother's womb. And he's been laying there at that gate, which is called Beautiful, for over 40 years. He's over 40 years old, and he's been laying there begging all of his life. And Peter and John walk by, and, and they uh, call to him. And he thinks they're going to give him some money, and so he looks up. And Peter says, no, I don't have any money, silver or gold. I don't have any, but what I do have, I'm going to give it to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise and walk. And that man starts running and jumping all over the temple. This crowd gathers, and Peter has the opportunity to preach his second gospel sermon. It says after that sermon that the number of men rose to 5,000. Previously, it would seem that the number of believers was at 3,000. And so think of the reach of this miracle. And think of how perfect this miracle is. You have a man who's been sitting here for 40 years. He's part of your visual picture as you go to the temple. There are things around this church building that you may not even notice anymore because you've just seen them over and over and over again, and they kind of become part of that image that you think of when you see Robot Parkway Church of Christ or thinking that he's part of that image of the temple. He's been sitting there for 40 years. 
Everybody knows he's lame. And so when he starts jumping around the temple, people take notice. And so you have this amazing miracle. How, how would you like it if somebody asked you if you would like to be that guy on that day? How would you like to have your name written into the pages of Scripture, be part of this amazing miracle that brings thousands to Christ? How would you like to be that guy on that day? And I'll raise my hand. I'd love to be that guy. I, I think that's such a high honor. But let me ask it again. How would you like to sit in the hot sun and in the cold winter at that gate, lame, begging for 40 years? That's a different question. And you see, I, I wonder how many times the thought came across that man's mind, why, why am I here? I see all these other people that are running around doing what they wish, that have resources galore. I see so many people that have it better than I, and I don't understand, why is this my station in life? And he wouldn't understand until that day that Peter looked down at him and he said, what I do have, I'll give to you. You see, God puts us in the body just as He desires. He's put you in places that only you can reach. He's given you influence that only you have. He's given you abilities that only you have. And, and you know, as I think about that little boy, you don't have to admit to this, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many tears were shed this morning just looking at that little boy's story? How, how many hearts did he touch this morning just through his story? Uh, the, the newscaster, I don't know if you uh, heard it, he said that video had 800,000 hits. That's an old video. I looked just yesterday, it has 2.1 million hits today. At what point in that boy's life do you think it ever crossed his mind that me, through my weakness, because I have cerebral palsy, and because my mom has a, a little phone video over there watching me go around this track, how, how, when do you think it crossed his mind that because I am in this condition, I'm going to touch over two million people. It never would have crossed my mind. I don't think it ever crossed his mind. And, and so whether it's through the abundance of talent or whether it's through weakness, God plans to use your life. He plans to use you just as he desires. He's given you what you can handle. And, and to, to get bogged down in why God, why, is, why am I this way or that way, that, well, that questions the wisdom of God. He's got that part figured out. He's thought through that part. And the emphasis for you and I is not the portion that I have, but the proportion to which I use it. That is the question for you and I this morning. My grandma got involved in foreign missions a few years back. We're so proud of her and the things that she's done with that. Uh, but I remember the first trip that she went on to the country of Albania. She came back and she told us a story uh, about a lady that wanted to do something. And she didn't have much. She couldn't do much, but she wanted to do something. And she was one of the locals there, and there were other missionaries working with them, teaching the Bible through teaching English. And this old lady, she had, she had an old camp stove. That's all she had that she could contribute to this work. She said, I can't do much, but what I can do, I can show up every day at lunch, and I can use my old camp stove, and I could cook lunch for all these people that are working here. I can do that. And that's what she did. And she touched lives. If all you've got is an old camp stove, can you still work for God? Absolutely you can. That lady did. You know, there, there's a fallacy in paying attention to the haves and the have-nots. And Well, I could do this if I was a have, but I'm a have-not, and so I, I can't. The, the worldwide median income, listen to this, well, the worldwide median salary is $1,225, and that is per year. To be in the top 1% globally, you have to earn about $34,000. Dollars. I think we're a bunch of haves. In so many ways, we're a bunch of haves. And I have this little coin at home that I, that I bought in Jerusalem. It's, it's called a lepta. It's called a mite. Whatever you call it, it's a small copper coin worth a fraction of the cent. Jesus said two of those constituted the greatest contribution he'd ever seen to the house of God. As the widow put in her two mites. She gave all that she had. She gave in proportion. And number two, we need to make sure that we see our gift to God in proportion, not in the portion. Lastly, as we run this race, as we run this Christian race, the parable of the talents helps us see, to see that the way that we view God, the idea that I have of God, matters in the way that I serve God. The way that I view God matters in the way that I serve God. Verses 24 through 25. 
The one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you got scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. Is God the cop in your rearview mirror? Is the idea of God just so petrifying that he's always watching over me, just waiting to police my life? If so, it's stealing away the many wonderful opportunities that you would see otherwise in your life. Are you afraid of God? That, that he really just wants to call you out on a failure. That that's what he is waiting to do. You know, I, I think we miss sometimes the father to son relationship that he has spelled out in Scripture. And we know in our family relationships, there's a duty of care and a duty of loyalty from father to son. And I think we miss that all too often as we read through the scriptures and we think about what God is to us. Uh, there are so many hats that a Christian would wear. We need to learn to, to wear all of them. First of all, we need to learn to be a servant. All a servant has to worry about is keeping the master's commands. Whatever the master says, I need to do it. And so I'm a servant and I need to realize that. But he gives more. I'm also a steward. A steward is a servant who gets to make decisions, who gets to grow in their responsibilities. But you know what? I'm even more. I'm a son. God said that I am his son in John chapter 8 and verse 35. The slave does not remain in the house forever, but the son does remain forever. That was the point of the story of the prodigal son. Because when the prodigal came back, Sonship wasn't something that had to be earned back step by step. No, restoration to the son meant that everything that it means to be a son is yours again. You're my son. You are not a slave. You do not have to work to earn back my love because you are a son. And from father to son, we understand there's a duty of care and of loyalty. Let me see if I can illustrate this in some human terms. Last year, last November, the universe got right again. Uh, some call it Alabama 55, Auburn 44. <laughs> you can amen if you want to. <laughs> Before that, we had to live with uh, got a second for about a year. Amens are not welcome now. Uh, that, that, was kind of, that was kind of mild in comparison. I remember back to the days of Fear the Thumb uh, getting beat by powerhouses like Louisiana Monroe. If you're an Alabama fan, you know what I'm talking about. Painful times, painful times. But you know, you, you couldn't pay me to wear that orange and blue. And, and I know I'm an Alabama fan. I speak from that perspective. If you're an Auburn fan this morning, you know loyalty as well. I know you do. You know how it feels. You, you wouldn't give up your loyalty. Uh, in our marriages, there is nobody, there is nobody who knows my faults and my failures and my shortcomings the way my wife does. Nobody. Now, who do you think is my number one fan? We understand loyalty and grace when it comes to us. We like to think of ourselves as graceful and loyal people. Sometimes I think we make the mistake of thinking we're more graceful and more loyal than our God is. That He's just waiting to drop us. We're graceful, we're loyal, we wouldn't do that. Where did we learn grace? Where did we learn loyalty? Is that not something that we got from God? He said, I knew you to be a hard man. He didn't know. He didn't know it was God. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't factual in that statement. You will never be able to give it your best shot. You will never be able to give your best for God if you're always worried that He's just waiting to drop you. If you're afraid of your Creator, it's going to be impossible for you to give it your best. You've got shortcomings. I've got shortcomings. You commit outright sins. We all do. We need to get comfortable. We're not comfortable in the, in the fact that we, well, we, we want that to continue. We, we want to stop, but we need to understand that God is gracious and God loves us. You don't deserve God's grace. You don't deserve your spouse's grace. But praise God that He does not judge His children on the basis of works, but on, the, on, a, on a faithful and contrite heart. That's what our Lord desires. If I can get through this last point, I want to make it and we'll close. I just want you to picture yourself as that boy trying to make the, your way around that track, limping, your body laboring, you're in pain. 
could be that you're starting to wonder, should I have even done this in the first place? How could you not know that you're in last place? Of course he knew that he was in last place. But I want you to imagine that you are that boy's father, watching on from the sidelines. Can you imagine your heart bursting with pride, bursting with joy as you see what your son is doing out there on the field? That is the same pride that your father feels when he sees you give it your best for him. If you came here this morning having a job, but lacking a ministry, can I ask you to reconsider what you're doing for God? If you came here this morning having neither a job nor a ministry, your God needs more from you. Your God needs your best. And if there's anybody here this morning that, that's not given your life to Jesus Christ yet, you're here and you're not a Christian, I just want you to consider this, that this world would have you to hide your weaknesses. This world would have you to pretend to be strong. But where else can your weaknesses and your shortcomings and your broken life truly be redeemed? Jesus Christ knows them. You don't have to hide them. He knows them and he can take them and he can turn them into a thing of true beauty. That's what he offers this morning. If you're not one of his children this morning, I don't understand. I would encourage you, I would highly encourage you to come to know him this morning. If you have any need to come to him. If you're not a Christian, it's as simple as putting your faith in him that he knows what he's doing with your life. That he knows how to direct your paths. Give him your faith. Repent of those old ways. Put off that old man. Say, I'm going to live his way instead of my way because he knows. He knows how to live this life. He came and he did it. I'm going to repent. I'm going to confess him for who he is. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Not just here I'm going to confess it. I'm going to confess it to everybody I can confess it to. I'm going to be baptized into his blood for the remission of my sins. If you have any need to come, please come as we stand and we sing.